Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the DDLS, the five stages of the ITIL Service Lifecycle webinar. I'm Rebecca Newen, Marketing Executive at DDLS, and I will be your host for today's webinar. So before we actually get started, um, please keep in mind that there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. However, I do encourage you to enter your questions in the comments panel um, throughout the presentation. There are also going to be a short survey just before you leave, so please make sure that you do fill in that survey. Our panelists for today is uh, the one and only Gary Duffield, Strategic Alliance Director at DDLS. Our presenter today is Darren Smith, uh, our Technical Instructor here at DDLS. Darren is an experienced ITIL expert and technical instructor uh, with an extensive ITSM background. His current role involves delivering a variety of IT training courses from vendor certified to customised modules including the design, implementation and maintenance of systems and managed processes required. He has gained extensive real-world ITSM and vast technical experience from help desk through to strategic design across a wide range of sectors including uh, finance, telecommunication, retail, education and government. His passion is in promoting ITSM and technology as the business enabler in order to help clients make improvements to their work environment. And so without further ado, Darren, welcome. Thank you, Beth. Hello, everyone. My name is Darren. Can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. My name is Darren. You Smith. Fine, I'll be I'll be presenting to you the five stages of ITIL. This webinar will be of benefit for those who would like a simplified overview of ITIL's five stages, a breakdown of each stage into processes using a real-world IT example, and to learn ITIL terminology. Let's start with the terminology on this page. The first sentence, this webinar is an IT service. It will be of benefit or value to customers. That's you out there on the information superhighway, the World Wide Web, or somewhere out there in the clouds. The first bullet point identified a simplified overview of ITOL five stages. This should provide you with some sort of knowledge during the session. It's a good idea to document all good or best knowledge that you use to run IT service management in your service knowledge management system or your library full of your documentation. The second bullet point identifies a breakdown of each stage into processes using a real-world IT example. We're going to be using the email service as our real-world IT example and we'll be talking about some of the processes or areas that we need to manage in relation to email, including things like capacity and availability. A lot of these ITIL management processes align with the elements or technical processes that are used within the IT service itself. And the last bullet point related to terminology. I will prove to you that if you're running an IT department and therefore IT services, You'll already be doing most of what, if not everything, I'm about to present to you. I.e., you should recognise the concepts, or just apply a few ITIL terms to real-life terms, like the diagrams on the screen. Help desk is now being relabeled service desk, bringing us closer to ITIL compliance. I hope you get a connection with that phone number that's provided by the help desk if you're using IT phones. Let's start with some basics of ITIL. First of all. What is ITIL? Let's break the term down in reverse. We'll start with library. Library being a set of books, in this case, a set of five books that provide guidelines on managing IT services. Infrastructure. This includes your IT department, IT services, IT assets, along with the way you manage your IT services. And I think we all know what IT stands for. The second bullet point on the screen talks about frameworks. You'll notice that I've mentioned in the uh, bullet point 
the number one rule of Eiffel, there are no rules, except your own. You get to do whatever you like, using your own standards and rules, because real life IT isn't the same as a set of books with guidelines on running IT service management. Also, every IT department is different and is managing different IT services. And, sorry, the last little point, business focus, everything that the IT department does is for the betterment of the business, not the other way around. And just before we view the five idle books, there's a caution at the bottom of the screen suggesting that if you try to read all of these five idle books, they may cure insomnia. Not cause it, but cure it. So the five stages of ITIL are related in this screen. And the five nominees for the role of providing guidelines and best practice of IT service management are strategy. You need to start with some idea of what you have, what you want, and how you want to manage your IT service. Once decisions have been made, communicate these to the design team. Design team will take the requirements and design the IT service. After the service has been designed, we need to transition it into production. Once it's installed, it's operational, and we continually look for ways to improve both the IT service and IT service management. And using the diagram on the right of the screen, like life and your IT career, the cycle goes round and round. And finally, you will notice that the word service is a common term in each stage. Let's have a place look at the term service. Service versus service management. A service is a means of delivering value to customers. Service management, a set of specialized organizational capabilities for providing value to customers in the form of services. So service management is the work that goes on behind the scenes that manages the service. One of my favorite services is depicted in the picture over to the right, a food service. However, this webinar is about IT services, so let's put IT in front of the term service. So that is the IT word to the word service, and not a lot has changed. We're still producing value for the customers who are to the right of the diagram. Service management, managing the IT service assets behind the scenes, making the IT service work, which is everything to the left of the email icon. So services utilize service assets to produce value for customers or stakeholders. Let's take a look at both stakeholders and assets. So the stakeholders, here we have stakeholders, the definition being someone who has a vested interest in the service, including, starting from the left, suppliers. Then the IT service provider, that's our IT department, running and managing the IT services. And to the right of the email icon, our customers or users of the service. Service assets being a combination of resources and capabilities, Combined to run the IT service, so hardware, software, elements of service assets, and just a reminder, people are also a service asset as well. So let's take a closer look at the IT service assets on the provider side, so everything to the left of the email icon. Our IT teams, a specialist in their field, helping to provide IT services. These teams should sound familiar to you. Hardware specialists, software specialists, people who focus on monitoring and reporting of service performance, and paying the bills to keep the IT services running. And of course, our help desk, our primary point, contact point for our customers. Now let's apply some ITOR terminology. Once again, not much has changed in the diagram, just the names to protect the innocent. Teams or groups are now functioning. Technical management focuses on the hardware side of things. Application management focuses on the software side of things. We have a dedicated part department called operations control that primarily focuses on monitoring of operations 
And we've labelled the team that support us with supply, electricity, telecommunication links. We've labelled them facilities management. And of course, our health desk over to the right has been the red label service desk. We also have a selection of roles who are assigned accountability and responsibility for the work that needs to be done. But now we know what IT functions or teams and other IT assets we have to manage IT systems, we can get on with managing our IT services. First, a quick review of the five stages of the vital to get in with. Have a strategy. Strategy, where decisions can either make or break value. Hence why it's in the center of the life cycle diagram. It's central to creating value. So to the right, you can see the life cycle, so the strategy right in the middle. So let's begin with the concept of strategy. So the strategy is there for the purpose of guidance on how to view service management, not only as an organizational capability, but as a strategic asset. In other words, how best to make decisions concerning IT service management for you in order to provide value to your customers and stakeholders. So what are the list of guidelines or areas to consider in decision making? This is usually based on an understanding of what, who, how, when, if, and dollars. These high-level decisions need to be documented and communicated to the appropriate stakeholders of the IT service. Whatever the decisions and how we run IT service management, including the services, should align with customer and business requirements. In this case, in the form of a service level requirement. So we need to identify what the customer requires. Let's break down further strategy into the factors or processes that I talk suggest guides us in making decisions concerning management of IT services. So the areas to consider in order to help make decisions usually focus on service portfolio. This gives us a list of all of the IT services we've got, we want, or we've had that produce value. Financial management focuses on finance. Money is always a decider in most things. Business relationship management is the focus of the customers and what they want. Demand management, focusing on what the customers want, should give us an indication as to the patterns of business activity. And strategy management for IT services, decisions on how you're going to manage your IT services. So let's start at the beginning with portfolio management. Portfolio management is there to make sure the right services are being developed, the right ones are being maintained, and the right ones are being retired. As you can see in the diagram to the top right of this screen, we have the pipeline, the ones that are being developed, catalogued, the ones that are live and being maintained, and the retired section where we no longer need these services. Value is provided by having the right services in the right section of the portfolio. So consider this, an IT service residing in the catalog is not producing value and costing us to maintain it. You may consider moving this to the retired section. Of course, financial management will be happy about this. So over to financial management. Financial management secures the appropriate level of funding to design, develop, and deliver the services that meet the strategy of the organization. I call them the ABC of finance. However, finances are never that simple. The correct order is BAC, as you can see in the bottom section of this screen. The three main processes within financial management, budgeting. You need to start with a budget to identify where the IT dollars should go. Account. You need to account for where the IT dollars do go. And charging is to recoup the money. Most of the charges will be coming from the customer usage. Speaking of customers, we need to manage them, and that's what business relationship management focuses on. Business relationship management is there to establish and maintain relationships with the business, primarily customer relationships. It's all about them. 
and how well our services are meeting their requirements or their perceptions of that. Obviously, if we want to manage our customers well, you may consider a CRM, so Customer Relationship Management System. And as far as our customers go, we're focusing on the customer demand. We do have demand management, although primarily focused on the demands coming from the customers, there are other areas, legal, safety, political. It's all about the customers and how well our IT services are meeting them. But understanding customer demands, this may give us an insight into patterns of business activity. So where the business is heading based on decisions that have been made. You could actually use this report, Patterns of Business Activity, as a way of measuring the success in the decisions that have been made. Strategy management for IT services. This is where you need to decide how you want to manage and improve your IT service management systems. So you need to assess the service provider's offerings and capabilities and decide how to run IT services. I've noticed a lot of companies have decided as the way of running their IT services, a lot of companies are utilizing a web chat, chat system to substitute for telephone calls in relation to service issues. That would have been a decision as to how we're going to manage our services. Here's a hint on the screen. There's a library of guidelines to help you decide how to run IT service management using some of the world's best practices. Of course, being our ITIL library. And the output of service strategy, or a collection of all of the information collected together, will create a service package. This is a document or a collection of documents containing details of all the elements that would be needed in order to proceed with designing the IT service. The service itself may be a combination of core, enabling, and enhancement services. The core element could be the email service itself, meaning possibly the email server. Enabling service, that could be seen as the network service, which could also be seen as a service itself. So it could be seen as a core service. This is once again one of the decisions that needs to be made. How are you going to manage the services? And are you going to manage the network service as an enabling service primarily or as a core? and an enabling service. And as far as enhancement service goes, these are like optional extras, whether the customer would like these or not. All of the information is collected together in the service package, sometimes also referred to as a service level package. I've given my interpretation of what a service package or service level package may also be called, a scope of works or a sales order. Whatever the decisions are, as long as they are of benefit or value for the customer and the business, which is primarily what we'll get from the service level requirements. With this uh, service package, we need to hand it on to service design to get them to design the service. So our second stage, service design is there to realize the service provider's strategy, facilitate the introduction of these services, in other words, fulfill the strategy requirements of the service package. They will design services so efficiently that, or effectively I should say, that minimal improvement during the life cycle of the service will be required. In other words, they're going to design the service right the first time. And design the service the requirements of the service package received from strategy, ending with a formal service level of the service level agreement will form part of another collection of documents called a service design package that you can see to the right. All of the details about the service will be stored in the service design package. Before we start to design, we need to check the requirements first. Can we do this technically? We need to double check that what strategy is provided to us can be done. So we have service level management. They will assess the service level requirements in the service package to confirm service level requirements can be achieved. In other words, very much like pre-sales. So we're not going to send anything to the design team that can't be done or supported in the future. 
We're going to put our name to these service level agreements that must agree with the requirements before any work is started. Once confirmation of the requirements has been identified, then we move into handing over the service package to the design coordinator, allowing them to begin designing the service. And at the end of the design, we will formalise the SLR, the service level requirement that the customer and business wanted, with a service level agreement. And we will continue to monitor the service level agreements and the service levels on a regular basis. So once we've confirmed all is plausible, we pass the service package to the design coordinator. What does the design coordinator do? They coordinate the design. Or as it mentions on the screen, provides and maintains a single point of control for all activities and processes within the service design. Service design package is the output of service design. Service design coordinator is the person who is responsible for making sure the documentation is complete. And a good design coordinator will save time and money. I've given an analogy to the design coordinator in the little title or diagram screen to the top right. Um, I suspect they sound awfully much like a project manager since they coordinate the design itself. Supplier management. If the design requires supplies of some sort, supplier management is there to manage the quality of services provided by suppliers and to ensure value for money is obtained. Any suppliers required for the design need to be costed and scheduled. Availability of the service. Availability management ensures that cost justifiable availability exists now and in the future. Hours of availability tend to be its focus. And what if during those hours a bad event occurs? So if we start looking at the diagram in the top right hand corner, it looks like we want an email service that's available 24 hours a day. We need to design the service for the 24 hours. The last sentence says the availability of the service will rely on service components or assets to support it. So if we need to design a automatic failover into the service by possibly mirroring or clustering our email service that would allow one of the components to fail, the other one automatically taking over, meaning the service has not stopped. So the service is email, the server, the email service are the components Duplicating or triplicating the components means we have an availability system for the service in case we have been failure. But what if you can't create an automatic failover option, i.e. technology costs are too great, or if the automatic failover option fails itself? Well, then we're down to, rather than an automated failover option, a manual failover option, IT service continuity. This will support business continuity management plans by making sure that IT services are prepared for any disasters. Yes, I've relabeled this to disaster recovery. So we need to make sure that we've got a plan and the event of everything going wrong. One day, hopefully, we'll get to an automatic failover system once technology and the price are of appropriate level. Capacity is one of the elements that we need to consider during design. So we need to ensure that cost justifiable capacity exists now and in the future. We'll have a capacity plan. And there are three sub-processes of capacity management which are linked. Business capacity relies on service capacity. If we can't provide extra services, our business will not increase in size. However, those services are reliant on components. If the components do not have the appropriate capacity, we cannot increase the size of the service, which means the business is not going to increase. So I suggest we spend a few bucks at the bottom, and that should be the top. Security management. 
combine IT security with business security and ensure information security is effectively managed. We do need to communicate security decisions in relation to the service with a security policy. This will identify who's allowed to touch what or do what with the service. Make sure the security policy is available to everyone who needs it and that they agree before usage. And last of in service design, we are talking about catalog management. Catalog management pr produces, maintains, and ensures accuracy of all information on all live or soon to be live services. You would notice in the top right hand corner, the catalog itself has stepped out beyond the other areas of the portfolio. I've also mentioned on the screen after the SLA for formalized, you need the SLA formalized, then you can add it to the service catalog. You cannot add the service to the service catalog without the appropriate service level agreement. We also have two views of the catalog. At the bottom of the screen, I've identified there's a business customer view and a technical supporting view. To use the example of our email service, I'm going to suggest to you that the business customer view will be email and the technical supporting view will be exchange, group-wise, Lotus Notes, Gmail, Hotmail, whatever it is technically that is supporting the service. And the output of service design. After the IT service has been designed, full documentation needs to be completed within the service design package. So another package, but this time the service design package. The service can progress from the pipeline section of the portfolio to the catalog section, ready for transition into production. Service design package with all of the details about the IT service is passed to service transition. You will also observe over to the right that the service design, design package will have instructions on how to install, operate, and improve the service. So our transition team. They ensure that new, modified, or retired services meet the expectations of the business as documented in service strategy, service design stages of the life cycle. In other words, the transition team do the work that was designed in order to get the service operational. Whether it's dealing with changes, that's what transition debt deals with, is changes relating to IT services or the way we manage them. Changes are a very big part of service transition, and that leads us to change management. The purpose of change management is to control the life cycle of all changes, enabling beneficial changes to be made with minimum disruption to the IT service. I can suggest that generally your changes will come under three three areas or types of changes. Beginning with standard, standard changes are usually pre-authorized. Now, why pre-authorized? Because they're deemed as low risk, relatively common, follows a procedural work instruction, and it is pre-authorized to a specific team, group, or function. It ends up becoming a service request. For emergency and normal changes, these require authorization which can be supported by a meeting of stakeholders and technical teams that can advise whether the change should proceed. The meetings are referred to as TABs, and that may explain the yellow icon on the page. So TAB, TAB stands for Change Advisory Board. It is not an authorization board, and that's why the definition says stakeholders gathered together to support the authorization of changes and assist change management in the assessment, prioritization, and scheduling of changes. You'll also observe in the diagram, we've got the old term for the meeting for changes, change management meeting, and over to the right, we have the new ITIL label for the change management meeting being a tab. At the end of the CAD meeting, we should have a pile of uh, approved changes, hopefully, and we need to pass these on to someone who will coordinate the changes called Transition Planning and Support Management. They provide overall planning for service transitions and coordinate the other resources and service assets that are required during that change. 
However, not all changes require in-depth planning nor coordination. Once again, I've identified that if uh, coordinating the resources and assets required and a point of communication, I'm suggesting that they are performing something similar to what a project manager would perform. However, this time for service transition, not the service design. However. Police and deployment. Once the changes have been scheduled, at a high level, release and deployment being the team who will perform the work need to plan, schedule and control the build, test and deployment of releases. So they've received a schedule of work, then do the work. They also make sure it's been done. There may be pilot releases as part of the deployment. It depends on how complex the deployment is. And service validation and testing needs to be performed. As part of the service validation, there should also be a process for user acceptance testing at the end of the deployment. At the end of the deployment, it is assuming that some service assets may have been altered, whether you've added them, removed them, or modified them in some way. We have a team called Service Asset and Configuration Management who ensure the assets required to deliver services are properly controlled and that accurate and reliable information is available when needed. To manage your assets, you need some form of asset management system, or as I talk also, a configuration management system. The configuration management system will look into one or many databases, configuration management databases, and each database holding different types of service assets will hold a list of configuration items, which do refer to your service. As all other areas of IT service management, reference this information in order to understand what we have and make the best decisions, it's extremely important that the information is correct and up to date. Depending on the quality of information, it may provide us with knowledge. And we have knowledge management. Far there to share information, ideas, experiences, and to ensure there are, they, these are available to the right people at the right place at the right time. So all information and knowledge concerning IT service management needs to be documented in your own library. Access to the areas of knowledge, once again, needs to be controlled. Who's allowed to view or update what? The four areas of knowledge include data, information, knowledge, and information. And finally, the output of service transition will be a complete change. If it was a service installation change, the service will be ready to run. And in this case, our email service is ready to be operated. And that's when we need service operations. Service operations is there to carry out activities and processes required to deliver and manage services at agreed levels to business users and customers. I suggest to you that they primarily perform two tasks, monitoring and maintaining the service level agreements in order to maintain the service level agreements. However, not everything will always run smoothly and there may be events that affect service during its operation. The different events that may occur, we need to detect these so we have event management. They detect events, make sense of them so that the appropriate action can be taken. That depends on the type of event. So using our real life example, information events about email, everything's okay, fine and dandy. Warning, warning events could be that the emails are getting a little slow and exception, the email system is broken. Ideally, we'll try to automate them both monitoring events and the actions required with technology available. There may be more types of events that you wish to use as part of the category and logging process. Some events end up as a request for change and change management, but generally all bad or exception events ending up in incident management. So according to ITOL, incidents are bad. Incident management restores normal service operations as quickly as possible. They make the bad things really good. All incidents are logged, categorized, and prioritized. Major incidents will use a separate procedure. At this stage, we have to identify that they are either minor or major incidents. For our example, 
a major incident could be many users unable to access the email service versus a minor incident of one user being able to access the email service. However, that one user does depend on the error. And if the incident keeps repeating itself, even after we've restored it, maybe we need to find the root cause of what's causing it. And that's where problem management kicks in. Problem management finds the root cause of one or more incidents, either remedies or implements a workaround to eliminate or reduce the number of impact of incidents where a problem cannot be resolved. So folks, at the end of problem management, we either resolve the problem or create a workaround. If the problem cannot be resolved, we need to let people know what's going on. So we have known errors. We can break these, record them in the known error database. Each known error will have a documented workaround once we've identified it. And we can provide the known error database to our service desk, allowing them to resolve incidents more quickly by identifying what the workaround is and relaying it to the user or customer. Access management, providing the right for users to be able to use the service or group of services. This is related to, as I mentioned in the second uh, entry, details of access management is based on the policies defined in information security management that comes from service design. Access management primarily is there to respond to changes of access. And this is usually performed by assigning users to user security groups. And lastly, request fulfillment. I believe the most important uh, element on the screen would probably be the quote or the definition of what a service request is. So a service request is a formal request from a user for something to be provided. So they're not necessarily bringing up complaining about something that's gone wrong. Request fulfillment is there to manage all IT service requests from users, log all the calls, of course. And we've got a couple of examples, resetting a password or requesting for information or advice. Some of you may see resetting a password as a change. If it has been standardized, a lot of standardized change becomes requests because they've been pre-authorized. And the output of service operations is or are a number of reports. So we have the SLAM chart, the SLA monitoring chart, we have capacity reports, availability reports, security reports, and a number of other reports. These reports will be sent out to the appropriate management team for key performance indicators and improvement. And that brings us to our last stage, improvements. Continual service improvement. They align IT services with changing business needs by identifying and implementing improvements to both IT services and IT service management that support business processes. So improvements in each life cycle. Effectively, any small improvement at any stage of the IT service management should provide us with an improvement overall. So every little bit helps. What are improvements in the CSI register? Any ideas that you've got for an improvement, jot them down. It's a log. They call it a CSI register, I call it a CSI log. And review and analyze service level achievements. This will make sure that the improvements that we're coming up with are actually improvements and are of benefit and value to our business. To help us with uh, improving things, we have a term called CSI approach, or Continual Service Improvement Approach. And the concept of this is, is to give you a bit of a guideline on how to manage improvements. We'll start with the first step. In the diagram, in the middle column, we've got what is the vision. The vision that they're referring to, if you look to the right, is the business vision. So if we wanted to improve our email service, it better be in alignment with what the business wants. Assuming that the service improves, that should bring us more customers, that should bring more value to the business. So the first step in improvement is it must align with the business. 
The second step is we need to get a starting point. So where are we now? What is the baseline, a reference or starting point? In the diagram to the right, I've identified our current baseline, which appears to be 80 emails per second. And then once you've identified where you are, the next stage is where do you want to be? A target. The target that I've written in the diagram is a target of 120 emails per second. Once you've identified your beginning point, starting point, and that we'd like to finish up, the next box in the column, middle column, is how do we get there? You need to come up with a plan, and then you need to follow the details in your plan. At the end of following the details in your plan, the very last box in the middle column at the bottom, did we get there, is the way of reviewing or confirming that you got to the target that you are hoping to get to. And that's why to the right of that last box, measurements and metrics. Folks, if we have a look at the uh, results that we've got with the emails, looks like we've gone well beyond 120 emails per second. So that's a good indication. However, at some stage, someone's going to want more. And that's why if the CSI approach box over to the left-hand side of the screen, you cannot rush in your laurels in IT. How do we keep the momentum goblet going? There will always be a new version of something coming out, and you will have to improve. And folks, we're at the end of the webinar session at this stage, so I've got a little review and just covering a few of the basic questions, so I'll answer them for you at this stage. So the concept of why strategy is in the middle of the diagram, it is essential to creating or possibly losing value, so it's essential to value. Why is CSI inclusive of all the other stages of ITIL? If we can improve any stage of IT service management, that should give us an improvement overall. So CSI needs to find improvements for the team, performing service strategy, design, transition, operation. However, they also need to keep a check on themselves. And security management and access management. Which stages do these IT service management processes belong? Well, they are closely connected, and quite often you will find that the people who are performing Security management will also perform access management. However, security management comes from the design section or stage. They stipulate what the security parameters will be or levels will be. Access management in the service operation stage, they are just applying the permissions that were requested. And thank you all for attending this webinar. And we'll hand back to Rebecca. Thank you for that, Darren. I think what we might do now, Darren, is um, we'll, we actually have a few questions from the audience. Um, sure. Do you mind going through them? No problem. Fantastic. So we've got um, the first question from Jim. Now he asks, um, do I need a different person to manage each process men mentioned? Uh, that would be kind of difficult, actually, if we had each process having a completely separate manager. And I believe one of the last couple of slides was an indication that uh, access management and security management quite often can be performed by the same person. The reality is you probably do not have enough IT staff for each process. So the reality is we combine a lot of these processes into under the same manager. Great, thank you so much for that, Darren. Jim, I hope that answers your question. The next question we actually have is from Danny. So he asks, uh, where does service delivery management fit into ITIL? Uh, good question, Danny. Um, this is quite a common real world issue where people who attend our classes are often attend as a service delivery manager. As far as service delivery goes, you're primarily focused on uh, two major aspects, and that will be generally the customers that you're delivering the services to and the services that you are delivering to the customers. In that respect, I'm going to suggest that business relationship management, which has a focus on customers, it is part of service strategy, and service level management, which is more focused on the services and the levels that are attaining, 
from service design, that would be the combination that would allow a service delivery person to do their job appropriately. Fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, Darren. Now, the last question we actually have is from um, Craig, and he asks, what's the difference between customers and users? Oh, very good. Um, customers and users both use the service. So they're both utilizing the service. The difference, if we had to identify a difference, would be customers pay to use the service. Users just use it. So to use a real-world situation, staff members would be users of the email service that you uh, provide internally. If you're providing that service externally to a company of people, the company would be the customer, and the staff members in the external company would be the users. However, you can have one being, one being the same. A customer can be the user, and I use the example of your mobile phone account. If you're paying for the mobile phone account and you're using it, are both the customer and the user. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Darren. So I think that's all the questions that we actually have um, so far. Uh, but if you wanted more information on any of our ITL courses, um, please do visit our website at www.ddls.com.au or get in contact with us um, and your account manager. Okay, so on behalf of uh, DDLS, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And Darren, thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.